Hello! Today, I'm going to talk about crystal oscillators. First, let's talk about the properties of crystals themselves, and then we'll talk about how they can be used to make very stable oscillators. Any crystal has a property called piezoelectricity, and this is a property whereby if we distort the crystal, it develops a voltage. And on the other hand, if we put a voltage across a crystal, it will distort. So it has a reciprocal property that can be exploited electrically. So let's take a look at a crystal. It can be a crystal of quartz. Early crystal oscillators might have used what's called Rochelle salts, but a crystal is a crystal when it comes to what I'm about to say. Let's say we take a crystal and we cleave it along a certain plane and then grind that down to a specific thickness. I'm just going to draw a little rectangle here representing a piece of crystal of a whatever thickness, usually very thin. And let's put a couple of contact plates on either side of it so we can use the electrical properties of this crystal. Now what I'm going to do is put some voltage across there. So let's represent that by some plus and minus signs. And that is going to cause that crystal to distort in one way or another. It might bow, it might twist. I'm not sure exactly how that distortion works, but it will tend to distort. Now, if we remove that electricity, what's going to happen, of course, is that crystal is going to go back to its natural state. Of course, as it goes to that state, it's going to have some momentum, so it's going to go past that state and distort in the opposite way, and it's going to flex back and forth a few times. And as it does, it is going to create some electricity. Remember I said if you distort the crystal, it creates electricity. So we've distorted it by electricity. We remove that electricity and it's going to undistort, but then distort the opposite way back and forth a few times. So we're going to get a alternating voltage cross here where this will be positive to negative. Then it's going to go to neutral. Then it's going to twist the other way and go negative to positive. And so what we will see if we put an oscilloscope across this crystal, we will see it create a sine wave that dampens out. Does this sound familiar? It should because we've just recently talked about tank circuits, which look something like this with an inductor and a capacitor in parallel. And if we put a voltage across here, what happens if we remove that voltage? Well, what's going to happen is this capacitor is going to charge. And as it discharges, it's going to discharge through that inductor, cause a magnetic field. And then eventually it's going to be completely discharged. And now there's a magnetic field around this inductor. So all of our energy is now in the magnetic field. When the capacitor is completely discharged and can no longer push current through there, that magnetic field is going to collapse, pushing the current over to here, causing the capacitor to charge in the opposite polarity. And then that will go back and forth a few times. We've already talked about that. So we get the same kind of thing. So that crystal acts an awful lot like a tank circuit. Now electrically, it's a little differently. If we analyze what the crystal looks like electrically, we actually see something a little different. It's going to look like an inductor in series with a capacitor. And I'm going to leave out the series resistance for right now, but of course everything has some resistance, but I'm going to leave that out just to simplify things. But we also have that pair of plates making contact with the crystal. Let's draw that again. There's the plates, two plates. Oh gee, what did I just draw? I drew a capacitor, then I put that slab of crystal in there. So what we have is conductor, insulator, conductor. And so that makes a capacitor in its own right, and that capacitor shows up in parallel with the crystal itself. And so electrically, that crystal looks pretty much like this. It looks like a tank circuit with another capacitor in series with the inductor. So this property gives it some interesting properties in its own right. One is that this will resonate at two different frequencies. One will be at the natural resonant frequency of the crystal itself, which will be a series resonance. And it will also have a parallel resonance, which is dominated more by this capacitor over here. 
and less by that capacitor. So we have a series resonant frequency and a parallel resonant frequency. And when we develop oscillators that work on these, depending on the design of the oscillator, it will either operate as a series resonant circuit or a parallel resonant circuit. And another thing to look at, of course, is this capacitor right here, because that looks like another oscillator I haven't talked about yet. I'm going to talk about down the road when I talk about variations on other oscillators. But if we remove this capacitor here and replace that with two capacitors and ground that, well, now it's looking an awful lot like a Colpitt's oscillator, isn't it? But we have this other capacitor in here. And this, if we make an oscillator based on this circuit, we have what is called a clap oscillator. And so a crystal oscillator sometimes looks something like a clap oscillator. But let's get back to crystal oscillator circuits. So the crystal will have two resonant frequencies with different characteristics. So at series resonant frequency, what's the crystal going to act like? Well, let's look at a series resonant circuit real quickly. A capacitor and an inductor. And going back to the AC circuit class, we know that below the resonant frequency, as we approach DC, this capacitor is going to have more and more capacitive reactants. So it's going to dominate the circuit. So let me draw a little graph here. There's our resonant frequency. And below the resonant frequency, we are going to have mostly capacitive reactants. And as we approach the resonant frequency, that reactance is going to go down, 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 because as the frequency goes up, our capacitive reactance goes down. At the resonant frequency, we will have our lowest reactance. And then above the resonant frequency, this inductor is going to look bigger and bigger because as our frequency goes up, our inductive reactance goes up. And so that will climb back up again. And so now it looks like more like an inductor. So at our resonant frequency, we have our lowest reactance and that should be zero. And the only impedance left over would be whatever resistance was in there. I would lift the resistor out, but for now we'll put that in there. So if these two are canceling each other out at the resonant frequency, giving us our lowest impedance, then all we have left over is the resistance. But I'll take that out for now because I'm trying to simplify things. So when the crystal is working in the series resonant mode, it will essentially have zero impedance. So it'll be a short circuit at the resonant frequency. Below the resonant frequency, it'll look like a capacitor. Above the resonant frequency, it will look like an inductor. But at the resonant frequency, it will look like a short circuit. But of course, when we go to the parallel mode, and let's look at a parallel resonant circuit now. So now, Below the resonant frequency, I think I'll do this in a, another color here. So below the resonant frequency, this inductor is going to look more and more like a short circuit. In fact, at DC, the only impedance this will have will be its internal resistance. So if we ignore that resistance, this will look like a short circuit. So we have no impedance at low frequencies. And of course, at the higher the frequency, the less capacitive reactants we have. And so at higher and higher frequencies, this starts to look like a short circuit. And as we approach the resonant frequency, we get a peak like that. So at the resonant frequency, we have the highest impedance. So at the parallel resonant frequency, the crystal looks like a open circuit. And at the series resonant frequency, it looks like a short circuit. So if we go back to look at the crystal equivalent circuit, we once again have our series resonant circuit, which is the crystal itself in parallel with the capacitor made by the housing with the crystal in between. And as we go higher in frequency, this is going to have less and less capacitive reactants, look more and more like a short circuit. So it's going to dominate the circuit. And so what's going to happen is that it will have its series resonant frequency a little lower than its parallel resonant frequency. So that's the basic idea of what a crystal looks like electrically. So now knowing that, we can look at some circuits that take advantage of that to make oscillators. So the first one 
I want to look at will be the crystal coal pits oscillator where we essentially replace the inductor in the parallel circuit with the crystal. So this will be a little bit simplified. I will show a schematic of one that should actually work in a moment, but for now let's just look at a simplified circuit. I will use a bipolar junction transistor as my amplifier and we'll put a RF choke up here. We haven't talked about that before. I had that in other circuits and I pointed it out in the text, but a lot of oscillators will have a RF choke, a radio frequency choke coil here to prevent oscillations from getting into the power supply and other parts of the circuit where it doesn't belong. And this will be grounded. And typically our coal pits oscillator will look like, I'm going to draw that down a little lower, two capacitors and an inductor. Going back to the base, once again, we are oversimplifying this. So if we, oh, don't forget to ground the center of the capacitor. So that's how we know it's a coal pits oscillator because we have a ground between the two capacitors. Sometimes that might simply go to the emitter and there will be a resistor between that and ground. But if you see a split capacitor going to ground or very close to the emitter, which the emitter is grounded here, so they're connected together, you have a coal pits oscillator. And if we replace this inductor with a crystal, we now have a crystal controlled coal pits oscillator. And the frequency it operates at will be dominated by the parallel resonant frequency of this crystal. Now we might be able to tweak that a little bit by putting a trim capacitor here in these two capacitors, but the frequency is mostly controlled by the crystal. So the crystal is going to be ground very carefully. It's going to be cut at a certain plane, ground to a certain thickness and size so that it vibrates at a certain frequency and it will vibrate very precisely at that frequency and will control the frequency of this oscillator. So here is what should be a working coal pits crystal oscillator. I haven't tried this circuit, but it does have all the components. So you can give that a try. And I may make a video for my $2 and above patrons where I simulate this in a simulator such as LT Spice. And I may actually try to build one, but I don't guarantee I'll try to build one. So you can see this is a coal pits oscillator by the existence of the split capacitor right about here somewhere going to the emitter. And we see that essentially the crystal has replaced the inductor with a variable capacitor in series with that to trim the oscillator. And we see in the schematic that it says it will operate at one to five megahertz. So you would choose a crystal that is ground and will be stamped with a particular frequency somewhere between one and five megahertz. It should be fairly easy to find a crystal that operates at 3.579545 megahertz because that crystal used to be in every television to control the color burst circuitry. And so there were gazillions of those made and there's probably still a lot of them around. So you could get one of those crystals to make this particular circuit if you do a little bit of searching. So another popular crystal oscillator, in fact, probably more popular than the coal pits is the Pierce oscillator. And I will once again draw this using a bipolar junction transistor. Although the example I'm going to show uses a field effect transistor. Once again, we're going to ground the emitter, put our RF choke up here. And this time we're going to put our crystal from the collector to the base. And I'll leave out the other circuitry that we might put here because I'll show that in the example. And there's a 180 degree phase shift between the base and the collector. And then there's a 180 degree phase shift across the crystal because it acts like a resonant circuit. So we will get our positive feedback back into the base so that this will oscillate. And this will oscillate in this case at the series resonant frequency of the crystal because that's where this is going to act like a short circuit and give us our greatest gain going through the amplifier. So the coal pits oscillator will oscillate at the crystal's parallel resonant frequency where the Pierce oscillator will resonate at the crystal's series resonant frequency. So when you buy a crystal, you need to know 
is the resonant frequency stamped on the crystal its series resonant frequency or its parallel resonant frequency because that tells you which kind of oscillator you may want to build. However, the crystal is going to work either way. It's just depending on the oscillator you build on which frequency it's going to resonate at. So now the next oscillator I want to talk about is another version of the Pierce oscillator, which uses a simple CMOS inverter. Now we haven't gotten into digital circuits yet, but this is the symbol for a CMOS inverter. And a CMOS inverter looks pretty much something like this. We have a CMOS gate and a resistor here so that we put a voltage here. I'll just put that as a positive. We'll put a voltage there. It's going to have a 180 degree phase shift between there and there, so that would be negative opposite polarity so whatever we have here we have the opposite there so that's basically all it is is just a transistor but it's shown in schematics as the logic symbol of a cmos inverter so what's going to happen if we put a crystal from there to there from the output to the input so we've taken the drain of the transistor, which is the equivalent of the collector of the bipolar junction transistor, and run that into the gate, which is the equivalent of the base on the bipolar junction transistor. So we have a negative feedback going through here, which gives us a 180 degree phase shift, turning that into positive feedback. So basically it's the same exact thing. It's a Pierce oscillator. Typically we would have a resistor in here, which controls the gain and then a couple of capacitors to ground. Starts to look a little suspiciously like a coal pits oscillator, but it's considered a Pierce oscillator. And of course, it's going to oscillate at the resonant frequency of this crystal. So this is a very, very popular type of oscillator, by far probably the most popular type, because this would be used in digital circuits to create the clock or other square waves that we need in digital circuits. And a lot of circuits such as microprocessors will have a couple of connectors. We label oscillator plus or minus or something similar to that where we've simply put a crystal. That's a good drawing of a crystal and possibly a resistor and very possibly a couple of capacitors to ground. And no need to have these trimmed because the frequency doesn't have to be precise. But we see this particular type of Pierce oscillator all over the place. A very popular version of the Pierce oscillator used in digital circuits. And this reminds me of a circuit that used to be available many years ago, no longer available. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but there it is. I think it was an MM5369, but don't quote me unless it's correct up there. But basically it had this inverter that went to a counter with no external countable output, but did finally come out here that if we put a 3.579545 megahertz crystal there, which remember that's the color burst crystal from the old analog televisions, which there were gazillions made, out would come a 60 hertz square wave. That was awfully handy for a lot of circuits. It wasn't really a square wave. It had a, I think a short duty cycle. So it wasn't nice and symmetrical, but it did get a nice 60 hertz square wave, which can come in handy in the States and other places that tend to sync up things on the grid, which is 60 hertz in this area. But they don't make these anymore. I think someone makes a version of it, but it's kind of expensive, but you might be able to find uh, old stock of this particular circuit if you need it. But that's just something interesting that I thought of, the old 5369, if I remember that number correctly, uh, which could turn a color burst crystal into a 60 hertz sine wave with just adding, you didn't have to add the resistor, just add a little couple of capacitors, one's a trim capacitor, to tweak the frequency just a little bit. So the last thing to say about crystal oscillators is their stability leads to use in a lot of areas. And of course, one of those areas would be 
broadcast radio where we need to have a very precise frequency. In fact, up until the 1930s or so, I believe, the National Bureau of Standards used crystal oscillators for their master clocks to tell the exact time until they switched to atomic clocks later. But these crystals had to be temperature controlled because a crystal oscillator will drift based on temperature. So crystal oscillators are used a lot in uh, amateur radio and CB radio to control the frequency. But if you need to be really, really precise, you need to have a temperature controlled crystal. And so a broadcast transmitter will have a crystal inside an oven. And what it looks like is basically a vacuum tube. So there's a, a base with a metal can. So it's a looks like a metal vacuum tube instead of a glass one with some pins to plug it into a tube socket. And inside there is a heating element. I'll just show as a resistor, a temperature sensor of some sort, not going to draw it as precise as I could, and of course a crystal. And that would keep it at a constant temperature so we could have a very precise standard for our radio transmitter, which would be necessary for broadcast radio. And have a radio that can be tuned to different frequencies. These will typically go to a device called a phased locked loop, which we will talk about in the communication circuit class after we've talked about analog and digital and everything we need to lead up to that. It's a fairly simple but very useful circuit. So that's about what I need to say about crystal oscillators. The crystal itself acts like a tuned circuit. It has a parallel resonant frequency and a series resonant frequency, which is a little lower than the parallel resonant frequency. We can use that crystal to replace the inductor in a Colpitz oscillator and get a Colpitz type crystal oscillator or use it in the circuit I showed earlier, the Pierce oscillator. And here's what should be a working Pierce oscillator. Once again, I haven't tried this, but may try it a little bit later. So that's about all I have to say in this quick overview about crystal oscillators. The crystal acts like a resonant circuit. It has a parallel resonant frequency and a series resonant frequency, which is a little lower than the parallel resonant frequency. And it can be used in either mode. A Colpitz type oscillator would use the crystal's parallel resonant frequency, where a Pierce type oscillator would use its series resonant frequency. And the crystal is ground to a very precise size, so it vibrates at a very precise frequency and controls the frequency of the oscillation, which makes them very useful for precision oscillators. Hope you found this useful and informative, and to help other people find this video, please give me a thumbs up down below. It helps people find the channel, and be sure to subscribe and hit that gray bell when you do so you get notified when I put up new videos. And as always, a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon and my other donors. I could not make these videos without your support. To learn electronics technology and perhaps become a certified electronics technician or just get a jump start in your studies in electrical engineering, you can go to vocademy.net and take my free course. And to help me put these videos online and to keep Vocademy free, you can go to patreon.com slash vocademy and pledge your support or go to support.vocademy.net and see other ways you can pledge your support. Again, a big thank you to my patrons and donors and thanks to everyone for watching.